What is up you nerdy people? Welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to talk about a topic that is both timely and a bit personal. As you've probably figured from the title, the topic of today is imposter syndrome, especially in the tech industry. And the reason that it's timely is that May, as most of you probably know, is Mental Health Awareness Month. And even though imposter syndrome is not a proper psychological diagnosis, it's still a psychological condition that is not exclusive to any particular group of people, although it is considered more prevalent among women and minorities. It's very hard finding numbers on this topic, but from what I found, about 58% of people in tech have experienced imposter syndrome, and out of all people, about 70% have experienced imposter syndrome at some point in their lives. And that's a lot. This topic is also a personal one because two and a half years ago, imposter syndrome induced stress and the need to prove myself drove me to burnout. And how fast and from what background I had gotten to where I am had me doubting whether I actually deserved to be where I was in my career. But I'll talk more about that later in this video. Before we go any further, I wanted to define what I'm talking about when I'm talking about imposter syndrome. A common definition of imposter syndrome is the feeling that I I think a lot of people can recognize is feeling like a fraud, feeling like you don't deserve where you are. It's literally what it is. It is you consistently feeling like you're an imposter, that you are not what you say you are and you're afraid that people are going to find you out and you're going to lose everything that you've worked for and that will bring shame to you. What's really in the center of the syndrome is shame and I think the reason why it's so important to talk about this is that validation releases shame, which means that whenever someone acknowledges that, you know what, like, I feel like this sometimes too, it releases that shame that we carry when we think we're all alone with this. To anyone who's ever experienced this or is experiencing this at the moment, I want to tell you that you're not alone. This is something that is very common and let's talk about it so that no one has to feel like they're on their own. If you've ever felt like a fraud, if you've ever experienced imposter syndrome, leave a comment below. You don't have to share anything that you don't feel comfortable with, but if you have situations or experiences that you want to share, sharing is caring in this case, and the more awareness that we can actually bring to this topic, the better. So obviously the industry that I work in is the one of tech, and I want to address this particular issue particularly in this industry, and why it seems that it's still very common in tech, 58% of people, but why is that when tech companies are going after the most brilliant talent in the world that people still feel like they don't belong and they don't deserve the career success that they have. To address that I want to talk about three things that I think are contributing to the feeling of being a fraud or imposter syndrome in the tech industry and I want to preface this with the fact that these are my opinions, these are not researched results or anything but come from my experience and what I've witnessed and what I've experienced myself. The first reason that I want to talk about is probably the most obvious one, which is that tech companies attract a very young type A personality. And this group, a lot of the times, has very perfectionist tendencies, sometimes unrealistic expectations of themselves, and very little experience in the industry or in life to actually ground themselves to. This all can quite easily combine into a lot of feelings of self-doubt. If we look at some statistics, according to Harvard Business Review, perfectionism in young people has been on the rise. What's concerning is that out of the three types of perfectionism that they describe, which are self-oriented, socially prescribed, and other-oriented perfectionism. The perfectionism that has risen the most is a socially prescribed one. Socially prescribed perfectionism stems from the perception of others' expectations of you. It's not necessarily the reality of others' expectations of you, but the feeling stems from what you think others are expecting for you to do. And out of all of the types of perfectionism described in the article, socially prescribed perfectionism has the strongest link to a host of mental conditions such as anxiety, suicidal ideation, and depression. It's not that detail orientation itself is a bad thing. It's something that a lot of people in tech need to be able to create successful products that users enjoy. It's just that when you're surrounded by people that all aim higher than the last one, it's really hard to not go overboard and aim to deliver 
perfection every time. This can easily lead to a host of issues such as imposter syndrome where you look at everyone around you doing so well and you think they're delivering perfection and that the expectation is that you do the same and obviously that can contribute to imposter syndrome and let me know in the comments if this is something that you relate to. Personally I think this also now extends to not only our colleagues but to basically everyone. If you look at how social media is looking like right now during this lockdown, it's like everyone's having this huge competition of whose mental health routine and self-care routine is the best and who's read the most books and who's been the most productive and if you can't be this productive during this pandemic, do you even want to succeed in life? And I think it's also creating a similar kind of pressure to be perfect and share this perfect life that you live in lockdown, whereas we're literally all just sitting here in our sweats and trying to get something done. But it's not that you can expect the same things of yourself as you could before this lockdown. So taking this point, I think, is really important. What you see on the surface is always just the top of the iceberg. So I think remembering that is helpful. Another point that we probably don't think about as much, but is very typical to the tech industry, is that career paths are very flexible and fluid. Put your hand up in the comments if your background isn't exactly what you would call typical for someone in the tech industry because there are a lot of us. At the same time, it's incredibly exciting that in an industry that keeps changing and innovating all the time, not having a background in the industry doesn't mean that you can't be successful. But on the flip side, not having spent years and years honing your craft and becoming better and better at what you do can also make you doubt whether you have the skills to actually deliver what you expect of yourself. When you keep finding yourself in new roles that you technically may not have experience for, although some of your past experience probably completely qualifies you for the job, Job, that thrill of the industry and the change and the innovation can actually very quickly turn into doubt. The amount of times that I have asked myself, how on earth did I get here? Do I deserve to be here? Do I have the expertise to do this job and be in this industry? Did I somehow manage to fool people into like giving me these roles and when are they going to find out? I've, I've asked these questions to myself so many times. The reason that two and a half years ago I ended up burning myself out was that I was hired to replace two people. When I came into the role, obviously my first thought was that people smarter than me have calculated that they can replace two people with one and add some development responsibilities to the mix, which in hindsight, which is always 2020, I know that was impossible and I know that was unrealistic, but at that point, I was already very young. I think I was 23 when I got the job and I had a need to prove that they didn't make a mistake hiring me and, and taking that chance on me. Even though obviously businesses don't hire to take a chance on someone, businesses hire for the potential and for the experience that you have. But that was how I felt. And so for about three months, I worked almost day and night. I worked between 12 to 16 hours a day and I had to deliver client projects at the same time while trying to re-engineer the processes that the two people previous to me had developed, which were for anyone in the data industry, Microsoft Access processes for processing sometimes hundreds of thousands of rows of data. And they spent days processing data that could have taken minutes. Just let that sink in. But a part of my job was to re-engineer those processes while still continuing to deliver client projects. And that combination, obviously, to any sane person or anyone who'd known better um, sounds absolutely insane. And so I ended up working way too much. I didn't want to ask for help because obviously I didn't want them to find out that I couldn't do this. And so I was trying to come up with ways to actually be able to do it. And after three months of doing this, I was cracking. I found myself crying in the bathroom at work because of 
minor issues and difficulties that in any given normal situation I could handle like that. I was so exhausted. I didn't enjoy my work anymore even though in so many ways it was exactly what I wanted to do and I can't recommend that to anyone. There is literally nothing in this world that is worth burning yourself out over. And the worst part was that I was telling people that I was fine. I know for a fact that people don't believe that I was fine but at the same time I had such a need to prove that I could do it but the problem wasn't that I couldn't do the job it was that no one could have done the job like no one could have done two and a half people's work in eight hours a day and that was the problem but I didn't see that all I could see because of imposter syndrome was my own perceived incompetence and just the fear the fear of being found out. If I could go back and be like, oh, you poor girl, this is not how work is supposed to be and it's okay to ask for help, I would. But I've learned a very important lesson from that and it's whenever you feel like you're not enough resources to do your job, it's time to ask for help because burnout is just not worth it. And a lot of the times we try so hard to be enough resources for work that we just end up hiding a complete resource problem and when I finally came to it and I asked for help, it took two weeks to find someone within the organization who was interested in getting trained in what I was doing. It wasn't a one person job, it was two and a half people's jobs that ended up expanding so that we ended up having a team of five and three people helping me. And so it, it just took for me to admit that this wasn't doable. I had more overtime in our system than the system allowed me to book. The system just like couldn't comprehend that someone would work this much. So I want to say that no matter where you are in your career, you deserve the role that you are in. The people that have hired you have seen your experience, they've seen your potential and they believe in you. And I know that some people think that they're imposters and frauds too and they also have no idea what they're doing but personally I have so much respect for the people that I work with that I I cannot in any good conscience think that they would be idiots enough to somehow by me lying myself into a job and especially right now like this is my second job in this company I have literally gone through a total of 10 interviews for my jobs in this company so at this stage I I should not have a shred of imposter syndrome I sometimes still do but I try and remind myself of that every single time the third and last aspect of what I think drives imposter syndrome in tech is the persistent lack of diversity, especially in technical roles such as engineering and data science. Like last year, Wired consolidated a set of diversity data from big tech companies and the fact is that the portion of women in tech has increased, but especially in technical roles, even though the numbers are better than the first report in 2014, the growth is isn't that significant actually in some cases it's very stagnant and even late last year the number of women in technical roles was not yet one in four the numbers for people from non-white ethnic backgrounds were even more bleak essentially the number since 2014 had barely grown or stayed the same is this a problem with just big tech companies no, the same groups that are underrepresented in tech companies are also underrepresented in technical education. But it doesn't mean that it's not a problem. And does this mean that no tech company is diverse? No. But big tech um, fang or whatever you want to call this group of large tech companies are some of the most visible employers in tech. And when you end up working in an environment where most people don't look or sound like you, it can be really hard to feel like you belong. And I'm not pretending to speak for any minorities. Um, I can't describe their experience. This is just something that I've witnessed and I've heard accounts of and I'm not trying to speak to their experience. I speak as a woman in tech and from my experience and even that 
sometimes is rare. Because of it, whether it is that you're a woman or in an ethnic minority, you have probably had to experience doubt, rejection and stereotyping and that can undermine a lot of that feeling of deserving something and feeling like you belong in where you are. And no matter what underrepresented group you belong to, it can often become a self-fulfilling prophecy and, and the spiral of doubt that you have when you think that maybe you were a diversity hire or maybe you think that other people think that of you and because of that you might think that you don't want to stand out any more than you already do because you might be the only one of whoever you are in that room and that knocks down your confidence a level or two and because then you don't stand up for yourself and you don't bring out your ideas because you don't want to make yourself, you know, the center of attention, that then spirals into other people realizing that you're not bringing out your ideas and, and maybe you are not contributing as much as you could and that might undermine their confidence in your expertise. And when that doubt is introduced in their minds, that just like completes the cycle where you think that they think that you don't deserve this or, or you don't have the expertise and you can see how this could go on and on. <laughs> Being the only one of anything in the room can also make you feel a lot of pressure of representing the entire group by yourself, which obviously is not the case and no one can be expected to do that, but that is also a huge burden until we reach a better state of diversity and representation in technical roles in tech companies, there will be an uneven mental load on people. So if you are experiencing imposter syndrome, what can you do? The simplest thing is just to remind yourself that this is real, you are where you're supposed to be, and you didn't get here by accident. It's easier said than done, but making a conscious effort to stop the thoughts and not end up spiraling into a place of doubting yourself is really important. We often forget the fact that what we think about and how we feel may not have anything to do with the reality. And our brains are incredibly powerful, but they can either be our best friend or our worst enemy. One thing that I would say is that if you feel yourself getting into a place where you doubt yourself, one thing that helps me in a lot of ways when I need to gain control of my emotions is um, the stupidest thing and the author of this is also called it the stupidest thing. So if you haven't read Mel Robbins' book, um, The Five Second Rule, I would highly recommend it. She has also a lot of talks and a lot of material on YouTube. And so if you'd like to check that out, I can link some of it in the description box. One thing that I would definitely recommend is trying to gain control of your thoughts by simply just counting back from five. So you go five, four, three, two, one. And by the time you're at one, that has interrupted the thought pattern that you were going on and activated your prefrontal cortex and that means that you have a brief window of time that you can take action in and by taking action and doing something else and distracting your brain you can break that cycle of thinking and at least for that little bit get out of that spiral that can so easily become such a toxic place for yourself that I don't think anyone should experience. And lastly, I would say talk about it. I know that it can be hard sometimes, but as I said in the beginning, validation releases shame and finding other people that have experienced this is something that will help you. To be fair, if you look at the numbers, 70% of people have at some point in their lives experienced imposter syndrome pretty much means that, you know, us frauds, we're all in the majority and the 30% that never have experienced this are the weird ones out. So talk about it and find people to exchange experiences with and even just tips on what they do when they are feeling like they don't deserve what they have. This is a very personal topic and I would never like anyone to share anything that they're not comfortable with, but if you are and you have experienced imposter syndrome, feel free to share any of your experiences in the comments and let's take a little bit of that stigma out of this particular psychological condition. If you are experiencing imposter syndrome now or in the future, remember you're not alone. I hope that you are taking care of yourself and your mental health during this pandemic 
pandemic and during this lockdown as well. If you found this helpful, hit the thumbs up. And if you'd like to see content like this in the future, click the subscribe button and ring the bell so you don't miss an upload. And I will see you in the next one. Cheers. Cheers.